home to one of the biggest contemporary nature conservation efforts, Sir Banias, a desert island packed with wildlife. Animals from multiple continents roam freely on the island. Sir Banias is part of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, or UAE. The reserve was established by Sheikh Zayed Al Nayan, who created a kind of Noah's Ark for one of the rarest species of the time, the Arabian Oryx. This island of the white antelope became Abu Dhabi's natural oasis. The Emirates have seen development at breakneck speed. A dhow against the modern backdrop of Abu Dhabi symbolizes the rapid growth from fishing settlement to booming metropolis. The UAE is a record breaker when it comes to the consumption of energy, resources, and water. So even in my own lifetime, it got difficult to keep up with the changes. You know, I can point uh, at something uh, unique and beautiful and enormous and tell you that this was desert five years ago. So I can't even imagine what it's like for my father or his father before him to see uh, where we were and what we've become. It all began in the oases of Rup al Khali the largest uninterrupted sand desert in the world. It brought the Arab Bedouin Federation of the Bani Yas to the glass palaces of Abu Dhabi and Dubai. The name Sir Bani Yas, the island of the Bani Yas, harks back to the political union from which the ruling families of Abu Dhabi and Dubai came. The first recorded mention of the Liwa Oasis dates to the 17th century. It's located in the part of the Rup al Khali that borders Saudi Arabia and now belongs to the UAE. In the desert, water is the most precious commodity. Only in places where there is enough water can settlements develop and people survive but locating it isn't easy. Luckily, people in the region had some outside help. The Arabian oryx, which is the white one, best animal to find the water source in the desert. So in the past, the people that you follow the tracks of oryx wherever went on the wild, they find the water source. So maybe that could be a reason why they choose Arabian oryx as a national animal of the UAE. It's no coincidence that the name Abu Dhabi means father of the gazelle. During a hunting trip in the 18th century, a gazelle led the Liwa Oasis Bedouins to a freshwater spring. There, they established a fishing village. According to legend, it was the dawn of a new era. In the mid-19th century, the coastal settlement experienced its first boom through the pearl fishery. It exists somewhere between tradition and modernity. The visible contradictions are proof of the rapid changes the emirate has gone through. Abu Dhabi has long outgrown its geographic area. Its skyscrapers and other magnificent buildings require a lot of space, which is reclaimed from the sea. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque the city center around the Etihad Towers and the Qasr al-Watan Presidential Palace are statements in the global contest for influence and prestige. Even the locals gaze on with astonishment. 
The main island on which Abu Dhabi is located has more than doubled in size over the past 50 years thanks to land reclamation concepts. For a long time, the race into the future knew no bounds, until climate change began to demand otherwise. There are many ways to express luxury, but here, one thing takes center stage, water. The desert's most precious commodity has become a symbol of excess. One of Shaykh Zayed's many achievements is free access to water, which according to the Quran, every Muslim is entitled to. But climate change is making the desert ever harsher. So it makes sense to limit private water use in favor of irrigation. When Sheikh Said was signed to be a ruler of Abu Dhabi, um, he was having a big vision in his mind, which he started it from Malayn, which is the green one of the desert. And then he moved it here in 1971, which means he started planting trees on the island and preparing a nice environment for the animals. Many species of animals from different regions of the world have found a home here. For one particular species from the Arabian Peninsula, the wildlife refuge was a matter of life and death. At the time when uh, Sir Banias was established, the Arabian oryx was one of the very endangered species. We only have few left uh, in, in, in the country and in the region. Um, so Sheikh Zayed basically decided to allocate this island, which is uh, a huge island, uh, for protection of uh, this species uh, at the time, among others. Almost 40 years later from the establishment of this uh, island, today the Arabian oryx is no longer endangered species. For the Arabian oryx, Sir Bani Yaz became a safe haven, paving the way for an amazing comeback. The desert is considered to be Allah's garden, from which he removed everything that was superfluous. But wild animals were by no means a part of that. Sirubamias Island is 87 square kilometers, and half of our land is a nature reserve, animals freely roaming inside. There are mountains, grass patches areas, on the plantations, the trees. Yeah. The island reserve also provides protection for eland antelopes. Barbary sheep from North Africa, and blackbuck antelopes during mating season. Unlike elsewhere, the animals here don't face poaching or other harmful human influences. That's reflected in their relaxed demeanor. different species in the island, uh, mostly uh, from like Africa, Middle East, and Asia, more likely from India. Most of the animals are gifted or donated to the Sheikh side because he used to save his own species at the beginning and uh, neighbor countries realized, why don't we ask him to take our species? It's no secret that striped hyenas and cheetahs are severely threatened. 
but it's less well known that giraffes are also endangered. In some countries, even gazelles have died out. The biggest challenge is the harsh climate, high temperatures and humidity. Apart from uh, these natural challenges, we have the challenges of providing like for different species which are not from this region, providing them with the ecological requirements that they need to survive here on the island. The abilities of wild animals to learn and adapt can be studied here. It's not only the herbivores that wait for their daily feeding. So do the predators. Once in a day, the truck go in the park, they drop off the food in the feeding stations. The animals, they do know the time or where they get their food. So they do move around pretty much mornings quite active in the feeding stations. And the water, we don't want to make a big pond. Then animals get relay on that water. Then they need water all the time, kind of. Thing. We want animals to move around all the island to look for the water from the grass patches areas. African cheetahs have been known to incorporate safari vehicles and even airplanes into their hunting strategies. So knowing daily feeding times is child's play. Still, not every hunt ends in success. All around the world, most of the conservation plans or conservation reintroductions fail because the animals were directly taken from an institution that is extensively taking care of the animals and then immediately releasing them to the wild. So they don't survive there because they don't have the skills to survive in the wild. Sir Bani Yas is the result of extensive landscape planning based on scientific research. The same can be said for urban planning in Abu Dhabi. The architecture reflects the idea of harmoniously combining the past, present, and future, following the notion of etihad, the Arabic word for community. And the animal depicted on the UAE's emblem reflects that too. Falcons are a big part of uh, Emirati uh, heritage and tradition, and that can be seen on our crest. And having a falcon hospital just shows you how serious we are about protecting this heritage that goes hand in hand with the nature that this heritage is tied to as well. The head doctor at this unique animal clinic is a German veterinarian. She was awarded the highest civilian distinction by the crown prince himself. With over 11,500 falcons per year, we are the largest falcon hospital in the world. Falcons have a different significance here. In Europe, falconry was the sport of kings in the Middle Ages. It was for the aristocracy. Here, falconry has a completely different background. Just 40, 50 or 60 years ago, most Emiratis were Bedouins living in the desert. They used falcons to hunt for meat for their families. They couldn't have survived without falcons. The birds were never just a piece of sporting equipment. They were integrated into the family. Falcons had the status of a family member, and that's still the case today. We're not just caring for birds here. We're caring for the children of the Bedouins, because that's how falcons are still seen today.
The UAE was the first Arab state to make private ownership and trade in wild animals punishable by law. The move was all the more significant because big cats in particular were considered status symbols. Genuine efforts to stop illegal wildlife trade, as well as an international commitment to species conservation, are showing clear signs of success. We have a smitter horned oryx, which was declared as extinct in wild in 2000. And we have around more than a thousand individuals heard of a smitter horned oryx on the island. We see that our success is very good for captive breeding and preparing a population for future reintroductions. The Environment Agency Abu Dhabi, they took up a project of reintroducing them in wild in Chad by contributing a breeding herd. The project is basically going very successful and they have been able to revert the status from extinct in wild to critically endangered. So it's a big success story. The repopulation in Chad shows that Sir Bani Yas is much more than a safari park where peacocks walk side by side with cheetahs. The scimitar oryx, not to be confused with the Arabian oryx, was once widespread throughout the Sahara. It was later eradicated from its last refuge in Chad. There still seems to be little concern among people that up to a million species are on the brink of extinction. They include the East African, or Beiza oryx, one of the four species of oryx on Sir Banias. Here on the island, uh, we have multiple species, and we have species that can interbreed, and we don't want hybrid, so we have separated them in different zones. And then we have some enclosures that have different sexes because we need to control the population to maintain quality rather than going for the quantity. Sir Bani Yas is now home to some 16,000 wild animals. The reserve's management cooperates closely with international conservation organizations. That's one of the reasons why the successes and setbacks experienced here provide valuable information for wildlife parks around the world. That also applies to the elaborate system of hoses used for irrigation. a genetically viable population that is not the victim of gene deficiency and we are processing this strategy through bloodline exchange and then we are doing some rewilding projects where we start modifying the behavior of animal. The white antelopes don't actually need any fencing to protect them from the cheetahs. The purpose of the fences is to separate an older pair of brothers from their own offspring. Otherwise, there would be fights over territory and prey. The oryx have no reason to fear the cheetahs, nor does the ranger who accompanies them on their daily hunt for food. It's his job to observe whether they catch prey and get enough to eat. The older they get, 
the more difficult hunting becomes. Peacocks and cheetahs once shared the same habitat, until cheetahs became victims of human activity in Asia. Not only were they hunted excessively for their beautiful coats, they were also captured and trained to hunt. The pair of brothers on Sir Baniyas came from a zoo. They had no experience with either peacocks or giraffes. After some training from humans, they learned to hunt. They've now been self-sufficient for nearly a decade. Our three cheetahs at the present, they can't really uh, make, control the number of animals, but it can make a difference. So cheetahs can keep our animals in natural fear. Cheetahs, and probably striped hyenas as well, are extinct on the Arabian Peninsula. Giraffes and Baiza oryx face a similar fate in some of their native African habitats. We take animals from captive uh, bred institutions we bring them on the island and then we raise them. Once they are adapted to the climate on the island, we start rewilding, we start stepping back and we provide more of a natural habitat to them so that they can learn how to survive in the wild. Whereas peacocks have multiplied, it's been difficult to find suitable females so the cheetahs can reproduce. Even though there's room for improvement, the successful reintroduction of animals into the wild is the kind of high-profile success that means a lot to the Emirates. With sufficient capital, it can be easier to create artificial habitats than to preserve natural ones. The oil boom catapulted the Emirates to being one of the world's most dynamic economies. In just five decades, black gold created ostentatious wealth and steadily increasing CO2 emissions. Despite all the similarities, there are also differences between the seven emirates that make up the UAE. Sharjah, for example, aims to differentiate itself from Dubai Skyscrapers dominate the cityscape here, too. But instead of chasing records, the focus here is on preserving cultural identity. This can be seen in the costly renovation of entire districts. For that, Sharjah was named Cultural Capital of the Arab World by UNESCO. Heritage sites have been restored and can once again be admired, like these historic wind towers. Alcohol is prohibited here. The focus is on Islamic cultural heritage and individual tourism. That's helped it become more resilient against global crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. And it reduces resource consumption. The advent of tourism on Sir Baniyas came just a few years ago. Before that, it was exclusively a nature reserve. It doesn't rely on income from tourism, so a drop in visitors isn't an existential threat like with other wildlife parks. Where guests can enjoy really 
being in a hotel in the middle of nature and animals. We have a desert island resort and spa that has a historical background. It was a guest house of Sheikh Zayed, the light ruler of United Arab Emirates, that was converted afterwards to a hotel. The desert island is located eight kilometers off the mainland of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. It's 180 kilometers from the capital. Due to the low number of visitors, the animals are hardly disturbed, so it's possible to observe them close up without startling them. The Arabian oryx's calm behavior is a clear indication of the lack of threat. In places where they are hunted, wild animals demonstrate a fear of humans by fleeing immediately. Despite being an island, Sir Bani Yas is part of the desert tourism industry, which often uses motifs from the 1001 Nights folktales. Ecotourism is still a relatively new concept in the UAE. Until now, the focus has been on the kinds of services that often contribute to global climate change. But guidelines for green hotels and a system for awarding environmental prizes in the tourism sector aim to change that. There are hopes that sustainability will become more than just a buzzword and will be properly assessed. We try to work with the different stakeholders, including hotels, for example, to have certain programs in place to reduce their uh, water wastage, uh, their recycling capabilities. Uh, we even have a specific licensing uh, process for how environmentally sound their practices are on the ground. A camel ride gives a glimpse into the world of the Bedouins. Traditionally, their lives were determined by water and the desert. The absence of one and the omnipresence of the other. The infinite desert and finite water supplies were like two sides of a coin that together created high risk. That's still the case today. The desert's underground water reserves may only last another half century. In 1960, Abu Dhabi's first desalination plant went into operation. Its processing capacity was 50 cubic meters of water per day. Now, a new plant is under construction with a capacity of 18,000 times greater processing enough water to fill 360 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's set to be the world's biggest. It's a sign of how much economic development and population growth the nation has seen. Over the same time period, the population of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi has grown from 25,000 to over 3 million. About half of the inhabitants live in the capital city of the same name. One of the most lovely experiences that you can have here is escape from the hustle and bustle of city life and from work life. And when you come here, you can really switch off. I've worked and lived in so many different places, in Asia and Africa and Europe and Middle East now. And you feel like you come into this beautiful sanctuary and you have experiences that you will not have anywhere else. It's like a fairy tale. It's less of a fairy tale for the cheetahs on the lookout for food in this picnic area. The wild cats are especially good at hunting sand gazelles and cheetah deer.
they pay no mind to the tourists riding by. In fact, it might provide a useful distraction for their prey. But it seems they'll still have to wait a while for their dinner. Yes. You and I. Yes, you and I. The tourists have it much easier when it comes to that. You and I. An opulent Arabian buffet yes. awaits them every evening. They can also choose from a selection of specialties from farther afield, yes. such as Indian Mughlai cuisine or South African Brai. Tourism is an international business, and when it comes to the workforce, the UAE is especially global. Almost all of the Emiratis here are guests. The staff are from all over the world. We've got a total of 250 employees, and they are from the five continents. We are covering every continent in the world, and it's a total of 34 nationalities. So you can imagine having all these nationalities with different backgrounds, different mindsets, different cultures, They're working in one area, in one unit, in one environment, with no problems. Everybody respects the, the, the culture of his colleagues, the culture of others. The UAE officially declared 2019 the Year of Tolerance. It wasn't long before the slogan was put to the test. The Abraham Accords with Israel are controversial in the Arab world, in part because the agreement is being co-opted by others. But the symbolism of Abraham, or Ibrahim, is clear. A call to focus on what unites the groups, rather than what divides them. Ansir Bani Yas, the Arabian Knight, is a small step in that direction. A sustainable future demands another difficult reconciliation, one between economy and ecology. Here, slogans certainly won't be enough. Achieving climate neutrality is a far more difficult undertaking than erecting the world's tallest building, especially in a place where energy demands are met by burning fossil fuels. The climate crisis is taking its toll on the region through rising temperatures and sea levels. While cities are at risk of sinking into the sea, entire stretches of land are drying up even more. With temperatures well over 40 degrees Celsius in the summer, air conditioning consumes huge amounts of fossil fuels. So does the extraction of drinking and industrial water through desalination. Another result of desalination is higher salt concentrations in coastal waters, affecting coral reefs and marine fauna. These must be drastically reduced. It's not only the UAE that needs to solve this problem. Worldwide, over 140 million cubic meters of brine are released into the environment every day. A switch to ecotourism could bring relief. Places like Sir Baniyas are a positive sign. Always, to me, ecotourism highlights the conservation efforts. And if we see the economical perspective of ecotourism, if it's in a sustainable manner, it also supports financially the projects for conservation. Preserving and improving the environment are no easy tasks in desert regions. The objectives are complex and often conflicting. It's hoped that reclaiming desert through reforestation will have a positive impact on the local climate while combating global warming. Every day, around 30 tons of feed are brought in for the animals to spare the local vegetation. 
and the 3 million trees planted on Sirbani Yas need a lot of water. We're getting the water from the mainland, underwater sea pipeline from the desalinated plant from the mainland. It's about of 9 kilometers distant. We're getting water here, storing it on the tank, same time irrigating. The investments may pay off in the long run. In the UAE, environmental policy is based on scientific data, and Sir Bani Yas is a living, breathing research center. We at the Department of Culture and Tourism try to help promote the protection of our environment, whether it's in the sea or on the land. And we do have several initiatives to conserve our wildlife, but also have a sustainable ecosystem for this life to thrive in. Ever since Sheikh Zayed established the Wildlife Reserve in 1977, Ecologists and wildlife biologists have been working to improve it. Their experiences provide valuable insights about nature preservation and climate protection in desert environments. The land here called the Saltum or Salt Valley. So full of salt in here, another minerals like gypsum, uh, the hematites, uh, magnesium kind of stuff. So we need animals poop here to fertilize the soil. So if the animals nearby the grass patches areas with irrigation times, that water with the poops, it helps the area to fertilize. So year by year, the sand getting fertilized better. So we need less water, the trees or the grass to go naturally. Providing wild animals with enough living space is an effective means of climate protection. For one thing, it means putting a halt to mining in an area. And it also preserves natural resources, like these dry valleys, known as wadis in Arabic. So it has mining happened in the past, Sheikh Zayed is the one who stopped mining in the island. And the best thing he done, he didn't expose to the world much about minerals in his land. So he know that if the next generation they know, they might start looking for minerals, then they might destroy whatever he have done in the nature. Life is good. Good like you know it should. Increasingly, major efforts are being made to reduce emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, to prepare this oil and gas reliant economy for a future without fossil fuels. In a nutshell, climate change and environmental challenges are viewed um, very seriously in the UAE because it touches the uh, people day-to-day -day activities. Uh, people recognize the harsh environment we, we live in, uh, but also the urgency to take actions on these issues. In a country of wonders, where marble palaces and white mosques rise from the desert sand, it's also a wonder that the Arabian oryx was saved from extinction. Its rescue on the desert island of Sir Bani Yas was a historic success. And other species are thriving here too. Even the two cheetahs here have finally landed some prey.
The return of the white antelope marked the first time that a species once again flourished after having gone extinct in the wild. They are the national animal of UAE. If we take about of 50 dirhams not, this is the Arabian aurochs as a national animal. A lot of the things that you see happening on the ground today derive from the vision of our founding father, the late uh, Sheikh Zayed Al Nahyan. Um, it was actually his private reserve that was turned into the Sir Benias as we see it now. He understood the criticality of the species that were being hunted out in the wild. The story of an island being dedicated to the antelope is more than just a parable for Abu Dhabi, the so-called father of the gazelle. It's also a step towards coexistence between animals and humans, and a better planet for all living creatures.